from the simplest to the rarest of materials. From the barks and fibers of plants to the densest of hardwood. From paper and clay and precious metals to that most wondrous substance, a mind in flight, expressing itself in a torrent of words. These are the materials from which our traditional artisans and craftsmen have built solid and grounded traditions. Fragments of a nation waiting to be made whole by men and women who bring an entire culture and knowledge system into their creations. These are the chosen materials of indigenous craftsmen. They who are the embodiment of Dayao, our knowledge, our pride. It is part of human nature, this fascination and obsession with precious materials. From the gold that our ancestors used to adorn themselves, the silver with which we adorned our Catholic altars, the ivories that were carved into objects of veneration. In our continuing exploration of the materials from which visions of a nation are born, we look at all that glitters and attracts us. What do we find? Beyond these precious metals, and treasured materials is an ancient skill, a genius for creating beauty. In a previous episode from the past season, we examined the Ayala Museum's collection of pre-Hispanic gold artifacts. This comprehensive collection is made all the more important by the range of forms and object types, earrings, pendants, necklaces, belts, and other forms of personal adornment, objects used both in ritual as well as in everyday life. The collection's range also covers the many techniques used in creating these pieces, from richly embossed pieces to thinly beaten sheets, from pieces woven from gold wire or embellished with granulated beads to more elaborate pieces like this bandolier that combined many techniques integrated into an important ritual accessory. The range covers not only the object types and the techniques used, it also covers the many areas in the Philippines from where these were excavated. From Surigao and Butuan, Laguna and Bicol, Pangasinan and the Cordillera. The range of origins shows us just how widespread the gold culture was in the Philippines. Ramon Villegas, gallerist, Filipiniana scholar, shares his knowledge of our gold tradition. Siguro ano curious lang sila una nakikita nila yung piraso ng metal na kumikinang-kinang sa sa batis ano. Kumuha sila ng piraso. Uh, siguro meron silang yung apoy, ano? nakikita nila kung ano nangyayari sa gold. Natutunaw, tapos yung isang bata doon walang magawa, pinukpok niya. Ba, may pormang lumalabas. Ano? Tapos hinanap nila yung material na yun and further experimentation through uh, hundreds of years. Natuto sila what you can do with it. No? Yun yung Teoria na lahat ng bagay can be discovered uh, independently. Uh, of course, nag-trade din tayo, ma malawak nga yung trade natin at travel nung, even before the foreigners came. Yung Pilipino na nagpunta sa India o nagpunta sa ibang parte ng Southeast Asia, nakita nila yung ginagawa dun sa ginto sa ibang bansa. Kinokopya nila, inaano nila, dinedevelop nila yung karunungan na yun. Hanggat sa nag-develop tayo ng sarili nating kaalaman. Every region developed separately and every region uh, had a particular uh, need for development of, uh, of the uh, jewelry tradition. Yung mga Pilipino simulat sa Apol were, were great travelers. No? Hindi talaga totoo na na-discovery tayo. Matagal na tayong nakadiscovery sa mundo. So, 
lahat ng klase ng influensya na papasok na dito pagdating ng Kastila. Ang isang example niyan, ano, may mga klase ng jewelry na sinasabi ng iba, dala daw ng Kastila. Hindi totoo yun, ano, kasi dito talaga nag-develop yung design at yung Kastila ang natuto sa atin. The tradition of working precious metals into objects both functional and beautiful is still very much alive today. Among the Tiboli and other highland groups in Mindanao, metal casting was considered a gift of the gods. They specialized in the lost wax technique. One of the few metal workers who has kept the lost wax technique alive is Farabundos a Tiboli craftsman who works in Lake Cebu. He learned the craft from his father. Today, his small workshop in Lake Cebu turns out souvenir items and accessories. The lost wax technique starts when a wax model of the desired objects is created. The wax model is then encased in a block of sand and soil. The block is then fired to harden the mold while the original wax object melts away. What is left is a solid mold, which can withstand the molten metal that has replaced the lost wax. When the mold is destroyed, the object is cooled and then polished. In the Maranao village of Tugaya, other methods of metal working are still practiced and constantly refined. Brass vessels, kris, musical instruments like a gong, as well as other decorative objects, all show the metal working skill that survives today. A manifestation of a proud tradition began in pre-colonial times. It may strike some as ironic that a faith devoted to humility and simplicity would have so many precious gold and silver objects created to celebrate devotion. But in many ways, these precious adornments also point to a nation that was opening up, not just to a new faith, but to a world of new influences. Influences that our skilled artisans reinterpreted and made their own. Yung pagpukpuk kasi, pwede mong pukpukin yung metal hanggat manipis. Tapos pag na, manipis na yan, pwede mong trabahuhin mula sa ilalim at mula sa ibabaw. So, may pwede kang gawing disenyo by working a piece of metal yung itaas at ibaba. No? Yun ang isang technique. Yung, yung isang technique pa rin is yung paggawa ng mga kawad, yung wire. So, yung isang uh, piraso ng ginto, pwede mong pukpukin, gagawin mong diretsong ganyan, parang kawad, tapos iro-roll mo sa isang malaking bato na bilog, gano'n, ano, magiging bilog na yun. Tapos pag hinila-hila mo yun, hahaba yun. Ano. Theoretically, yung isang gramo ng ginto, pwede mong hilahin lang kung ilang kilometro, no, dahil sa quality ng ginto na pwede mong hilahin na gano'n. So yun ay isang technique, ano? Yung isa pang technique na ginagamit sa mga antigong alas na Pilipino, yung filigree, no? So yung filigree naman, kombinasyon ng kawad, filium, no? At saka granum, yung butil. So pag tinignan mo yung ibang mga uh, trabaho na antigo, merong kawad at saka grano. No? So, yung filigree yun. Pag uh, nakombine mo yung mga teknik na yan, kakaiba yung nagagawa mong uh, obra. No? 
yung designs kasi nagbabago yan eh, through the years eh. Uh, may mga moda-moda, nagbabago talaga. Pero pag pinag-aralan mo yung techniques, nandun pinagpapatuloy. Tapos, in fact, pag tinignan mo yung mga bagong production ngayon, uh, yung pa rin pinakamabenta, yung mga technique na, uh, kumbaga, reaches into the roots of uh, uh, the Filipino psyche, no? In the San Agustin Museum, there are many magnificent examples of precious metals used as sacramental objects. Gold and silver used in the sacrifice of the Mass, all for the greater glory of God. While some pieces are undoubtedly imported from Spain or Mexico, the majority were designed and crafted by Filipino metal workers. Nangyari sa Pilipinas noon, yung pangsuporta sa sa kolonisasyon ng Pilipinas uh, came in the form of silver coins. Yung silver coins galing sa Mexico at Peru. So dadating yung yung coins na ano na sa galleon ano. Uh, may nagsasabi na kumisan inaabot ng uh, 2 million pieces ano yung sa isang bar barko 2 million pieces ng pieces of eight. No? Yung iba nun, uh, binibigay ng hari sa paggagawa ng mga simbahan. So, pagbigay mo naman nung, nung uh, pilak na yon, yung perang pilak sa, sa mga pare, ang isang ginagawa nila dun sa, sa pilak, ginagawa nilang pang dekorasyon sa simbahan. So pagka medyo maganda yung dating nung, nung pera from uh, Mexico at Spain, ano, uh, gagawa sila ng napakalaking mga altar. Ano. The days of magnificent altar frontals made from solid beaten silver may be over. But the art of creating altar furniture from sheets of metal using the methods perfected by past artisans is kept alive today. Eddie Mutok of Pampanga has been awarded the honor of Gawad Mandilika ng Bayan for keeping alive the art of metal working. His specialty is ecclesiastical objects ranging from carroza panels to altar frontals. The patterns are designed by Mutuk himself, based on old examples that he has seen. These drawings are then translated into wooden carvings upon which the metal sheets are beaten. Here he demonstrates the basic techniques that his workshop specializes in. pattern. Sa kawin mo muna ay kuha ni Guguhit. At pagka guhit ng pattern, yun namang moldy ang gagawin mo. Pagkayari ng moldy, yun namang yellow brush ang susunod mo para lumitaw yung design. Pupupukin lang, pupupukin yun. Pagkalitaw ng design, sa sayang na naman ang lagay. Bubuhayin mo muna naman yung design para na-finish na. Pagka-finish ng design, itutubog muna naman sa silver. Pagka kuha sa silver, gagawa ka naman yung pinaka-frame. Nung magbula nung ma-reward nga ako sa Gamaba, nakilala yung gawa akong metal. Yung nagpapagawa nga, natutuwa sa ginagawa akong ganyan. Kaya dumadami yung nagpapagawa. In the work of Edi Mutuk, the tradition of craftsmanship for the greater glory of the faith is passed on to younger artisans. In the work of anonymous craftsmen from different indigenous groups, we see how these traditions are far more ancient. 
and serve the purposes of a different spirituality. The creative impulse, the technologies, the trade secrets and shared knowledge may come from different cultures, may serve different purposes. But in the end, each object speaks for a whole and integrated spirituality manifested in a craftsmanship that continues to be honed today. Wildlife conservation is such a pressing issue that we all rightfully should be concerned about, especially with regards to the use of animal parts for adornment. As filtered through our own sensibilities, the use of ivory and animal parts may seem almost barbaric. What justification could there have been for our ancestors living in times when resources were more plentiful? More than just elements that beautify or add prestige, animal parts are considered power sources that contain the spiritual essence of the animal. Many accessories of indigenous peoples incorporate parts of animals considered totemic or spiritually powerful. For example, among the Ilongot of Neva Vizcaya, the skull and beak of the hornbill are considered the potent source of the power that was much valued by a tradition headhunting society. Mounted on a fiber frame and worn on the head, the projecting beak and skull were the mark of an accomplished headhunter. In colonial Philippines, no other material sourced from animals was as valued as ivory. The collection of Santos at the San Agustin Museum, like the gold collection of the Ayala Museum, is a treasure trove of objects that show a wealth of styles, origins, and forms. All which show how devout Filipinos visualized the saints and the virgin. Esperanza Bunag Catmonton, foremost Santos scholar, talks about the Filipino fascination for ivory, a fascination that has only grown more from the time when the material was plentiful and the trade was legal to the present when a worldwide consciousness regarding conservation is prevalent. While many still believe that the early Chinese carvers in the Philippines were the only ones capable of producing ivory santos, Gatbonton's research shows that Filipino carvers were also capable of producing fine carvings in this rare, imported material. Sometime in 1590, the first uh, bishop of the Philippines writes about ivory carvers, Chinese huh? ivory carvers, here in Manila, carving the Nino Dormidos. You know, the Christ in the manger that we normally have, which is very similar to the Buddhas that they have. However, we also have, long before mga 1530s, there were a lot of carvers in Goa, and they were doing small-scale carvings of ivory for personal use of the missionaries, and for the churches in Goa. These were taken in as personal effects and sometimes commissioned for their churches here or somewhere else. No? It's not a, a per se a trade, but a small scale handling of, you know, to fill the needs of certain missionary groups, religious groups, for the, for the like they give gifts to the bishops in Spain, they would be sending because ivory is precious. But in the Philippines, uh, you have the first carvers in the Parian, of course, serving the needs of the local churches and the rich people. 
But if you read further on, for instance, in the Augustinian records, early period yan, no? in one of the footnotes of Father Rodriguez, uh, this is the historian of the Augustinians, he says that from the very beginning of time, uh, when they came here, side by side, working together in service of the church, were Filipinos and Indio, the Indios and the Chinese side by side working together in the service of the church. In the grand processional images like these from the San Agustin collection, ivory heads and hands are mounted on wooden frames and then dressed in expensive fabrics embroidered in gold and silver threads. Precious metals were also used for the halos, aureoles, and other symbols of divinity. In such santos, the work of many artisans came together. Sculptors, metal workers, goldsmiths, embroiderers, even encarnadores, or painters, who would tint the ivory faces to make them look more realistic. Here is another way of looking at these processional images as a synthesis of many arts and crafts that Filipino artisans specialized in. All precious materials enhanced, made even more beautiful and lasting, testaments to a diversity of skills, of technologies, of faiths. We have always treasured gold, well, Metallurgically, because of its malleability, gold can easily be shaped into many forms, forms of jewelry, masks, and uh, other kinds of crafts, and uh, do not break easily simply because of its malleability. Pure silver, of course, no? does not also tarnish easily. But that's why they have become prestige objects, objects made of gold, Ju gold jewelry, silver jewelry, they have become very precious in our traditions. And uh, also, of course, their wide av availability in our country was also a factor. Um, we became a center for gold trade. You know, Filipinos were very skilled in crafting gold so that they uh, became so fine. You hardly see the workmanship or us having been through some kind of labor. What you see is just what almost perfect skill. Uh, we are able to wed many, many pebble-like small particles into one whole kind of texture. You hardly notice how they were made. And this is the reason why when you see the, the gold craft of our ancestors, especially from Butuan around the 10th century AD, you'll really be amazed at how they were able to make these things without the technology of the day made by the machine simply because of the perfection that you see in them. Gold, silver, ivory, materials that continue to define our ideas of wealth, of status, of ostentation and display. But for our ancestors, there were undoubtedly deeper spiritual meanings to these materials and these objects. What we see as an extravagant display of natural material our ancestors saw as only the very best offering to their deities. And for a craftsman, the very best work in the very best of materials was the only fitting gift to the divine. It is their skill, their endurance, their heritage of patience and perseverance that animates these objects and makes them embodiments of Dayao, our knowledge, our pride.